Good evening, everybody. If you could please confirm uh, whether you could hear me, and if you could type uh, whether you could hear me on Q and A and not on chat, please. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you for confirming um, uh, the uh, participants. Once again, a very good afternoon and evening to all our viewers in, in Australia, in um, and in Colombo, and also in Dubai. Uh, I hope uh, this webinar will uh, bring you some insights to um, skill migration. We are today talking about not only general skill migration, we are also talking about employee nomination, right? How we will uh, run this uh, webinar is that I will go through very quickly some other time uh, slide presentations, and uh, most of you uh, would know about it. And we will look at some scenarios, and we will have plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, all right, let's go into our slides uh, right away. Excellent. So we are talking about today, navigate your journey to Australia. So that's uh, that doesn't uh, confine ourselves to general skill migration. Uh, it uh, also uh, will uh, go into uh, other uh, employer nomination and so forth. Um, all right. A little bit about uh, ourselves. Um, and uh, we will uh, then go into uh, general skill migration. Let me get my template right. So I'm Sanji Kaldra, as you can see in the same. I think the picture looks the same. Yes. Um, and uh, why is this giving me a little bit of grief? Just bear with me. All right. So a, a little bit of introduction to myself. Um, I'm a, a MARA qualified uh, migration consultant that is registered. And I have been so for over 17 years, but practicing migration now up to about 20 years. I'm also a, a CPA member and FCMA, which, which says I come from an accounting background. And um, I'm also a member of the Migration Institute of uh, Australia. Our practice has been built for a very long time uh, on, um, on trust, on dedication, professionalism, and we have uh, offices in uh, Melbourne, our head office, and we are represented in Sydney and in Darwin, and uh, also in Colombo, uh, where we have our general skill migration hub, and, um, and also in Dubai, uh, where it caters to the Gulf market. All right, so enough of uh, our, about our practice. It is 18 years plus, and thousands of successful migration stories. Um, and we have a lot of partnerships where they eat, uh, and it's a lot of stakeholders with the universities, with, um, with partnerships with uh, people who do uh, uh, our English or a NATI and, and so forth. And uh, with 30 plus employees scattered around the globe. Now, going into general skill migration, um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, let you all know is that I will have plenty of times for questions and answers. If you can, um, once I finish the slide presentation, you could go in and answer your questions. I'll answer the question, sorry. And we have a panel. Uh, they will be for Facebook. We are live on Facebook. There would be um, senior relationship managers answering your questions. Then we also have a panelist, Angelo um, Norton, who is our manager skill migration, who will be also answering if there are too many questions which come on the Q&A. So, uh, but please um, note down your um, uh, issues and uh, leave the questions uh, for after the presentation. All right, so um, 
we talk about general skill migration to Australia. So this is the more popular one. This is the, the one that majority of uh, us who have migrated to um, Australia. And going through very briefly, um, uh, pardon me if uh, some of these uh, uh, information that you already know, uh, hopefully we'll get more interesting down the track. We have to have a, an occupation. That's one of the main things out of the skill occupation list. And for each of the occupations, we have a certain set of academic qualifications and work experience and so forth. And sometimes even English requirements for certain occupations, like for example, accounting. You can't get a skill assessment without getting IELTS 7 each. Um, and you have to be between um, 18 and 44 years of age up to the age of 45. So if you're turning 45 tomorrow, we can still apply today. And what's the pass mark? 65 points. It really doesn't mean uh, much. Um, why, when, when I talk about 65 points, that has to be a minimum 65 points. But by this time, majority of uh, us know that, uh, uh, that uh, we have to apply for general skill migration through an initiation program, which is independent, with AT state, government sponsored, we had to wait for invitation. So the points are very straightforward. For age, you get points, for qualifications, for work experience, uh, for how much do you get on your English uh, results on IELTS or PTE, and the professional year, and then we call it also the credential community language, that's NATI, we call it partner points. And of course, which I have not mentioned here, is for people who study in Australia and apply for migration, they also have five points for studying in Australia uh, and also uh, the fact that uh, if they have studied in, in regional Australia, uh, also uh, getting more points for their regional study. So that's basically about general skill migration. And we have a few uh, uh, visa categories, we call it subclasses, and that's independent. So in short, for a person to um, have uh, independent, um, uh, to have independent, uh, to apply for subclass 189, your occupation must be in the medium to long-term list, right? And we'll come to that uh, a bit later. So we have what we call a medium to short-term, medium to long-term list, we have the short-term skill occupation list, we have regional occupation list and so forth. But to apply for a skill regional subclass 491, it can be in any list. Now this is, the 189 is a permanent resident visa, but 491 is not a permanent resident visa, it's a provisional visa. It's a visa that you get for five years, you need to live in a regional area, you need to work in a regional area for three years, and then you can on your own apply for 191 when you qualify one of 491. So, so what is the qualification? Living in regional Australia for three years and living in um, also working in a regional um, uh, Australia. Now, when I talk about regional Australia, I have to admit that it's not about in, 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 in the desert or some regional place where you know, there we don't see many people. It's not that. If you take, uh, if you're familiar with Australia, if you take the city of Melbourne, the city of Sydney and city of Brisbane, now close to the city, the suburbs close to the city, they are considered non-regional. But if you take Adelaide or Darwin or any other state of Perth or just out of Melbourne or just out of New um, Sydney or just out of Brisbane, they are all regional. So you don't have to worry about applying for a 491 visa if, if, if your relationship manager is, um, is uh, advising you to apply. And then we have skill nominated subclass 190. Now that's a state government sponsored visa too. Um, that's a state government sponsored visa, but that's a permanent residency. Um, and uh, the 491, um, the 491 and the 190, um, is um, always sponsored by the, the state. The difference is 
The 491 is a regional provisional visa and 190 is a permanent resident visa. Now, why have that difference? There's a reason for it. How the state governments, and when we talk about state governments, we have governments and territories in Australia. So the Department of Immigration has delegated um, some of the skilled migration positions to be determined by the state government, which is quite, quite a good thing because the state government knows what occupations are needed and how much are needed. So they make their own list and they have a 491 and 190. Again, the question, why 491, why 190? The 491 is regional Australia. So, sometimes as migrants, um, if you get an opportunity to come to Australia, you say, I want to go to Melbourne, or I want to go to Sydney, I don't want to live anywhere else. But if the state government requires certain skilled people in, in their regional areas, then they will say, look, for this particular occupation, I'm going to give you an invitation to uh, a 491 visa, but you need to come and live in regional, that in re those postcodes and, and, and fulfill the, those requirements and the need for certain, certain skilled people. So they have a very, very good way of determining the state governments, who are the skilled, what occupation do they want, how many of them want and when they do want, want them. So that's how the 189, 491 and the 190 works. And the 190, so I explained that they want people in regional areas, but if there's an occupation that is needed both in regional and in the cities, then they are willing to give a, a, a 190 um, invitation, a sponsorship, so that uh, you could keep on applying. Okay, so um, now that's, uh, that's about the skill migration uh, process. I will, just before I, I go on to the next slide, um, uh, I will, um, yes, not a problem at all. I will go back to our, our, our slides. And, uh, um, and uh, what we will do is, um, yeah, have a look at the, have a look at our, uh, slides once again. Let's go back to our... Right, so here we are. There we are with the slides with the... Um, and where we talk about the 189. How does this, how does this work really? Um, how the, how, I will also sort of explain the process. Um, should you go to your migration agent or should you go to come to us for advice? How does this happen? So somebody can come and say, okay, I'm interested in migrating to Australia. And then I mean, the first one of the first things we look at is we look at their CVs, their resume and, um, and have a chat about the occupation, find out the opportunities, um, the, the type of English requirements uh, that, that would be needed, and which state, in fact, might have that particular occupation. But it's a very dynamic situation. The state government uh, sponsorship is a very, very dynamic sort of situation where it's always changing um, the occupations, the requirements. Uh, the 189 is more, more stable. It's medium to long-term list, and... and um, it is a more stable, but you can actually apply at, um, what we call an expression of interest. But what happens first is that once we have a look at the CV and we advise him we, how to do a skill assessment and we do that process and, and the amount of English that they should get, this can run parallelly. Once the English and the skill assessment is done, now we are ready to lodge what we call an expression of interest. We claim certain points. Um, if we uh, go back and we claim on the age, we claim on the qualifications. And, and that is very, very important, extremely important that you claim the correct points. Because let's, for argument's sake, that you claim 85 points. But the pass mark is 65. And down the track, when the whole process takes place, 
and that you are not able to satisfy, let's say, five points, and you say, yeah, look, the past mark is 65. I, I, should, I should get the visa even if I get 80. But if you have claimed 85, you have to show the 85. And that is so very important to claim the correct points. This happens not about age. It's straightforward. You know, whatever the points, you know, 18 to 25 and 25 to 32 and, th you know, 33 to 40, they have their different points. English is straightforward. They can't go wrong. But when it comes to work experience, it is extremely important because from occupation to occupation, the way that you claim work experience is different. And for what jobs? You would have had three or four jobs, let's say, and with slightly different designations. It's up to the relationship manager to discuss and determine and advise that whether that work experience can be uh, got. Because let's say that you're account, uh, a tax accountant in one period, and maybe you're a management accountant in another, yeah, and you're a finance manager. On what are the occupations that you can bundle up and get the work experience? So that's very, very important that you claim the correct work experience. So once you launch an expression of interest, your relationship manager will say, okay, you can apply for a 189, you can apply for a 491190 for these states, and they lodge multiple expressions of interest. Is this the application? No, it's not. It's letting the government know, I'm interested in migrating to Australia. Here are my points. I'm interested to go to New South Wales, or I'm interested to go to Western Australia, and so forth. And await an invitation to apply for those. And every state has a different process um, of how you um, apply for state sponsorship. And that is, I won't go into it individually and uh, obviously your relationship manager will advise you best. So, and then if the state government approves it, this is for 491 and 190. I repeat, this is for 491 and 190. Then they will, the immigration department, they will approve the sponsorship and the immigration department will in, give you an invitation. But how the 189 works is that that is something determined by the Department of Immigration, the main Department of Immigration of Australia, which called is uh, Department of Home Affairs. So the 491 and the 190 is more or less determined by the state government and gives a uh, notice to the state uh, Department of Immigration to invite if they are willing to sponsor. But the 189 is determined by the Immigration Department. And they give you 90 days. And what we do is then we lodge the application and we have to support every point that we said that we were going to get, uh, we we're going to have in our EUI. So very, very important. And then it will go through the process of medicals and the police reports and supporting documents and submissions um, right up to the time that you get your visa. Um, now, this is all about um, what I've been talking about is general skill migration. Uh, majority of the time that you don't need a sponsor, but uh, need a sponsor nor, nor an employer, because obviously offshore, how, how are you going to find a job in an employer if you're living up, offshore? Um, so, but don't forget there are onshore clients, people who have come and studied here, people who are on work visa, they want to apply too. So, but then they will say, okay, if you're onshore and you're going to ask for a 491 or 190, I would like to see you working in, 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 living in our state, working in our state, have a proper job and so forth. But again, the rules are different to each other. Now, and this works on, uh, these visas work on strict quotas. But now I'm going to talk to you something very, very interesting that, that especially our practice specializes in is employer nomination. Now, employer nomination, um, uh, these slides uh, might not give you too much of information because they are um, uh, quite uh, detailed. We have four main different kinds of um, employer nominations. The first one we, is what we call a 407 trainee visa. So you are qualified, you have got a little bit of work experience, but you are coming to Australia, an Australian company is willing to um, train you up, train you to your profession for one year or two years which can then lead to other visas. That's called a 407 trainee visa. They are for young people, less experienced, recently qualified and so forth. Then we come across a very, very important visa category called the subclass 482. This is called temporary skill short aid visa. This is 
extremely for people who are familiar with how the Gulf visas work. So you get a contract to work in Dubai or so, and you are supposed you are working for two years in a particular uh, uh, for a company on a at a particular salary level at a particular designation. That's the exact thing which a water for it to uh, ease. It's a complex way of getting it because the employer has to show that 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 they can't find an uh, Australian uh, permanent resident or citizen for the job. That's pretty academic. That's the process that we go through. But it's very, very interesting because a 482 visa is what you call a temporary skill shortage visa. Now, this is a visa that is really available um, for offshore, mainly onshore, but may, uh, offshore too. And I'll tell you why. Onshore is, let's take an example of a person who has studied here. They got a job. They worked for two years. And those uh, 491 and the 190 and the 189 are still not worked out. They have put their expressions of interest waiting around. They're not going to invitation. Their post-work stream, that is after, st after studying, you get a post-work stream visa. That's coming to an end. So what do we do? You can ask the employer, look, my 491 and 190 is not, still not coming through. Will you sponsor me? And the employers are quite happy to sponsor because they have proved themselves, been a good worker, and so long as you have got two years of work experience. In the same company? No, it can be anywhere. Two years of work experience and suitably qualified. Now, the interesting thing is that if you work on two years on the on the 482 under the new laws, that's not been legislated, supposed to come um, today, 25th of November, uh, is that your employee, after two years of working, say, okay, they have done some good work in the company, we can sponsor you one residency. That's called the Employee Nomination Scheme, TRT, Transitional, right? And you see on this, uh, uh, on this, there is something called direct entry too. So the direct entry is where, um, now we are, we are from a 482, we go on to a 186 permanent resident visa. So we're transitional, working for two years on your 482. But there is an opportunity if your occupation is in the medium to long-term list and you've got three years of work experience and a skill assessment and an employer is willing to sponsor you, you can go for direct permanent residence sponsorship on a subclass, again, 186, direct entry. So it's really, really interesting uh, uh, opportunities available. These are for onshore and for offshore. And then we come where there is regional employers with wanting to sponsor you uh, and there is a visa category called a 494. 494 is for certain occupations that are not available uh, through a direct entry because you have to have your in your medium to long term list um, to get permanent residence directly. So if you have got another occupation and you're working in a regional um, with a regional employee, they can sponsor you for subclass 494 visa and. And from the 494 visa, after serving three years in that organization, without their sponsorship on your own, you could apply for a subclass 191 to permanent residence. This is the similar path to when I was talked about the general skill migration, the 491 visa. State sponsored, 494, employer sponsored, both leading up to a, a 191 visa. Right. A uh, lot to, uh, so effective 25th of November, there are some new changes. Up to, the, up to the period of now, what happened was from a 482 visa in order to go to permanent residency, you need to have worked for three years. You need to have uh, an occupation in the medium to long-term list. However, they have relaxed that. So it can be in any occupation. Now, what we are waiting for the government to uh, confirm to us is, does it apply to any list? No, without... They want to say no, no list anymore, any occupation. So long as it's in NANSCO, should be able to sponsor an employee for 482. And then after two years, that employer can opt to sponsor him, them for a uh, 186 PRP permanent resident visa. We are waiting on that final information. We'll know in the next couple of weeks um, that there will be no list. That is great news. That is wonderful news because there have been so many occupations uh, where, where employees have found employers, but unfortunately that occupation is not falling into these, this 482 list. So um, that's very unfair. So Australia has skill shortages and therefore these occupations will 
come really in handy. Take instance for a um, recently I got an inquiry from a, what you call a retail manager. Retail manager was not in any other list. I couldn't have sponsored him for a 482. Now I could. So this, um, uh, these uh, changes are really very, very interesting. Right. So that's for employer nomination. So for people who, uh, who have from offshore found a job, uh, found a job or and 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 the employee is willing to sponsor. Yes, you could have a chat with the employer, explain whether it was for the 407 training visa or whether this person qualifies for a 482 visa, skilled worker, or perhaps even a 186 permanent resident visa, or maybe even a 494 regional visa. So that's we would be able to advise and discuss with your employer. It's a win-win situation for everyone. Now I'm going back to a few scenarios my senior relationship managers have been able to put together um, some um, real scenarios of these are, uh, yeah. So, um, yes. So uh, what we have is, um, now, uh, Ishka, if you can please, uh, if you can let me uh, put it down as a questions answered at the time, as I said that I will be able to answer, go back and answer most of all your questions. Um, I'll push on with the slide presentation. And here is an applicant who is 35 years old, has seven years of relevant experience, married, qualified as a software engineer, and, um, and uh, also spouse is a civil engineer. So as here, the spouse points, the partner, if the partner has got a skill occupation in the medium to long-term list, civil engineer, yes, five points, English, other five points, partner has given 10 points. And the main applicant is the age between 32 and 39. So we get 25 points, work experience 10 points, ACS taken two away from the seven years because of qualifying. English, we know um, uh, zero because whatever the English, they have got only a band six or six. Qualifications at bachelor's degree 15, NAT has been five, total of 65 points. So um, we applied the applicant under skill work regional 49, which gives an additional 15 points. So that's another good thing that I have forgotten to mention is that when you apply for a 190, they give you five points. When you apply for a subclass 491, they give you an additional 15 points to boost up your points. Um, the second one, applicant is a 31 year old, 31 years old and single. So for people who are single, they get 10 points. But if you are married, um, if your spouse has six English, six each or, or a PT 50, they will get another five points. And if the spouse can do get a skill assessment, then again, get another five points. But for the purpose of single, to not to be disadvantaged, they get straight off 10 points. That's why they say single 10 points. The client needed time to go for IATS classes, but wanted to apply for a skill assessment immediately. We switched from assessing body engineers of Australia to ATS. So engineering qualifications, some of the engineering qualifications can be assessed either at engineer, Engineers of Australia or at WTSS. But to do Engineers of Australia, you have to have English. This gentleman um, had, did not have uh, getting ready for English. So in order to save time, what did we do? We ran a parallel one. We ran the skill assessment with WTSS, which doesn't need English, and we ran the skill um, assessment and English. Parallelly, they got, the person got ready. So they applied under a 190, which gave them applicant five points. And, uh, and was invited within 14 months. Of course, it's taken a bit of time. Now, this is another scenario for people who are between 40 to 45. It becomes very hard, but it's possible. Let's look at this. 43 years old, a single, has eight years of relevant work experience as an HR manager. We were struggling for points due to age issue. Yeah, at, at between 40 and 45, drops to 15. Uh, so, uh, or rather 10. So, single, uh, 10 points. Work experience, 15, uh, um, English, uh, 10 points, qualification, 15, five for CCL, and they have got four, 65. That's because uh, um, they've got a, 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 English, a good English score, uh, had, a, had a good qualification, had plenty of work experience, so it's possible. Um, we applied under skill work regional 491, which gives the applicant um, additional 15 points and received an invite within two weeks before the applicant turned 45. <laughs> we then wrote to the state mentioning prior rights in the nomination due to the application. So we, there is, I mean, the state governments of us quite 
quite good. I mean, we've, if somebody is turning 45 or, you know, a skill assessment is expiring or so, we can always, it's up to them to make that uh, decision, um, make that uh, make that decision. All right. Now, um, we um, have come to uh, a very quick uh, PowerPoint presentation with, you know, most of the things that you might have known. Uh, before I go into questions and answers, I also want to let people uh, in, in Sri Lanka's Hill Capital know we are having a Migration Education Expo. And this will be at KCC, which will be on the 9th of December. There will be a team of people, student visa specialists, um, relationship managers, our general skill migration uh, relationship managers to answer all the questions. I and um, and there will be also um, Zoom links available if you want to speak to other people from the other organization. Just come in in Candy KCC. Just come and say hello to us. Have you got any questions? Uh, yep, um, I'll say it. All right. Now let's go back and uh, let's look at some of the questions um, and answers we are going to uh, talk about. All right. Yeah, so um, the first question, um, okay, the first question comes from um, from uh, a person who wants to know the eligibilities for an ENS visa. ENS means Employer Nomination Scheme. What is the subclass? 186. It has two streams. One is that a direct entry. I talked about a direct entry scheme. For you to be in the direct entry, you have to have uh, have to have uh, what we call a skill assessment, right? You have to have a skill assessment and you have to have English uh, ILTS um, uh, uh, ES6 um, each and three years of work experience and your occupation in the medium to long-term list. So your employer can sponsor you. Um, if you are on a 482 with the same employer and under the current new rules, and you have stayed two years, it doesn't matter what the occupation is, you can apply for permanent residency sponsored by the organization for a 186. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, employer nomination. It's going to be, most of the uh, people will understand the, um, uh, most of the people will understand the, uh, I, I'm going to answer all, all, all types of questions. But remember, just because an employer wants to sponsor you, it's not straightforward. One of the main things is that they have to first advertise the position, and we call it the labor market testing. And we advertise it on a particular platform with particular information, and it has to run. And people who apply, we need to show them why they are not suitable, why they are not suitable for the occupation. And the person who is nominated, and that's you, why you are the best person. Then we have to show that this position is a genuine position, right? It, it, it can't be a, a small company who wants to employ accountant. Uh, you know, an, if to employ an accountant, your company has to have a turnover of a million dollars and five employees, we call them caveats, right? So there has to be genuineness. And most importantly, they need to be paid a market salary that any other Australian permanent resident or employ, uh, citizen would employ. And that has to be respected. What the market salary has to be more than 70,000 Australian dollars Class superannuation per annum. Very, very important. Right. Um, then, um, okay. Um, and uh, now, there are times uh, uh, can we submit a 189 and 491 and 190 UI in the same state? Now, the 189 doesn't come on to a, a state because that I said it's independent, right? Uh, but the 491 and the 190. Yes, so there are some times that you can, but I would most probably put two separate uh, expressions of interest um, because if you are qualifying for the 190, you'd like to only put for the 190 because that's the most superior visa to the 491. Right, and will they increase? Uh, will they increase the quotas uh, this year? Look, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a changing situation. Um, there, there will be always certain uh, migration is always taking place. Uh, after COVID, it has been very robust uh, and it, it has been taking place. So the increases in the quotas will come. Which state 
because the states are uh, playing a very important role because the one eight, other than the 189, the 491 and 198 are playing a very, very important role. So uh, they, depending on their requirements, their need for that state, that's how uh, so it's very difficult to uh, for an individual to say, okay, the quotas will increase, so I'll have a better chance. Right. Um, uh, 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 Kasum gives a good uh, uh, thing. Uh, thanks to Kasum for your question, and uh, you're giving me a good briefing. Uh, my name is Kasum. Now I'm working as an accountant in an Australian construction company in Sri Lanka on work from home from August 23rd. Overall, I have 11 years of work experience related to accounting with various companies in Sri Lanka. I have a BSc in accountancy and various uh, and finance. Successful completed a master's degree Master of Professional Accounting. My family members are and wife and two babies. Okay, I believe your masters also have done in in Sri Lanka. So the fact that you have done an accounting degree will qualify you as an accountant. The fact that you have got um, um, work experience will give you points. The, but what I don't know is your age. You have to be under forty five years of age. Now, a person like Kasun, what he does is does a skill assessment, does his English. Lodges and expressions of interest, and perhaps even look out for jobs of a company who is willing to sponsor. That comes from employer nomination. The, the the main difference being is that that when you are applying for a one eight nine and a four nine one or a one nine, you don't know when you will get your invitation. You're waiting for some time. But with 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 general skill, uh, the with the employer nomination, what happens is if the employer is willing to sponsor. They go through a certain process, the labor market testing, the advertising, and recording all these reports, and lodges an application. They don't have to wait for an uh, invitation. So, a uh, good question. And, and uh, customer, in, in any of I'm, I'm giving more general information. Please feel free to uh, mention um, about your attendance to your uh, webinar. And there is no uh, consultation, initial consultation cost with me, but certainly with uh, no uh, cost with the relationship manager. Have a chat. See how comfortable what uh, what your opportunities are. Right, um, uh, Niluka, how can I apply for a four two? I'm a nurse in Sri Lanka, fourteen years experience, three years diploma, IAS general. No, Niluka, it, uh, your particular occupation is a very tricky one because nurses in Sri Lanka are either diploma qualified or bachelor's degree qualified. More recently, your diploma qualified. So. The health sector in Australia are very, very stringent. A person like you must come to Australia, study nursing, study a conversion, and then only will be able to uh, apply for a 482 or perhaps any other visa. Right. Um, um, and we have, is it an advice to lodge a 190 and 49 EUI for the same state? Would this increase the chance of getting invited? Look, I think I answered this question. If you are... If you are suitable for a 190, just stick to a 190. But if you are suitable for a 491, then yeah, and, and if you then apply for both 491 and 190. Um, can I know your charges for skill visa from the skill assessment to uh, EOI and PR for 189? I think Taranga uh, is perhaps not an appropriate question to ask at a webinar, but what, what you could do is uh, the reason, uh, with uh, with respectfully, I'm, what I'm saying is that we have a differentiating price. Not all general skill migrants are th the same, depending on what your occupation is, and because in an certain occupations need very detailed skill assessment, some very straightforward skill assessment. So, and then depending on number of family members. So, from uh, from an applicant to applicant, the charges could change. Um, as uh, depending on as the occupation, your marital status, and uh, again your age. So, uh, but please feel free. Uh, there is no obligation. Uh, there'll be a fixed uh, professional fee, and that also is broken up to four parts: the start, the at the time of skill assessment, the time of EUI, time of visa application. So, as and when we do some work, only we would uh, we would charge, and that we clearly explain in our estimate of fees. ENS for offshore applicants, great question. Yeah, yes, it is. It's a bit dis difficult because it's very difficult when you're sort of in staying in offshore and trying to convince um, an, uh, an employer. But it's successful for certain highly skilled people. It's not un that's it's not uncommon. Um, they interview. I mean, we have this Zoom and all that. Now they interview. They demonstrate. Sometimes even employers 
um, uh, officer will go down to their country and um, see what their work is and whether they are suitable to come to Australia. Yes, it is possible. Right. Um, okay. And it, um, oh, right. We are getting the same question repeated uh, about the 190 and the 491. That's fine. We will we'll keep on going. I'm a service advisor in an automobile company. So if there are any chance to migrate to Australia, very interestingly, you are a service industry. Now, what we need to look at is, can you be a motor mechanic? Are you doing day-to-day -day motor mechanic work? Um, sometimes certain motor mechanics, they do motor mechanic work and then they, they get promoted, they get as assistant service manager, service manager, and so forth. Now, you could get promoted and get a higher salary and so forth. Sometimes that may be that you can't apply as a motor mechanic because you're not doing a motor mechanics job. But if you are a motor mechanic within the last 10 years, yes, still we can do that and claim work experience uh, for the period that you were a motor mechanic. Um, right. Difficult to get experience letters from past employees. Is there any other alternative ways to submit past experience for ACS skill assessment? Um, Chamika, um, very interesting that you brought it up with this ACS. Now, this is what I was talking about when I talked about that I can't give a set price of from occupation to occupation, it's different. Um, um, Chamika, what you could do is um, to see um, um, that if uh, if you have certain um, what you call documentation as the pay slip, the um, also the um, the uh, EPF and ETF. If it, if you're in Sri Lanka, your original employment contract letter, and I believe the relationship manager might give you some uh, op uh, sort of opportunities where your co-worker or a, a manager can give a side declaration or what type of work you did and so forth. But it will be a case by case. Um, uh, uh, basis. Please feel free to come and say, look, these are my own, my documents. Can it be done? We'll let you know before we start a process. What are the timeline for implementation after EOI submission average process in time? No. That's a question that is very, very difficult. It can be a week, it can be one and a half years, or it can be even two years. So um, we generally give an indication because it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, in in from an EOI submission to get an invitation. Right, let's have a look at this. 29 years, Colombo with a four-year work experience, a SAP consultant, and SCO, IT business analyst, system analyst. What I wish to understand is which subclass, 189, 190, 491 be the most suitable for the how do I go about HS skill assessment and your application. Now, that's what we do. Uh, oh, of course, you could do on your own, but we'll be happy to assist you. For those occupations, 189, 190, 491, everything we need to apply separately and together we would apply, um, uh, we would apply um, to uh, all those occupations. And how do I get about the skill assessment? Please feel free to send your CV, have a chat with our relationship manager, they will issue a very detailed checklist and an and, and UI. Right, uh, 30 years, uh, that is uh, Prashant, um, I hope I said pronounced your word correctly. Prashna, 30 years, Continental Survey has eight years UAE experience, having a bachelor's degree and a heavy membership in Australian Continental Survey Institute. I think, Prashna, you'll have some uh, very, very good opportunities. Please feel free to get in touch with our Dubai office. And they are the people actually who specialize in the Continental Survey occupation. Uh, and uh, you'll be meeting, uh, excuse me, Andrea Pereira. Uh, She'll assist you. She has helped many, many content surveys to migrate to Australia. Yes. Um, so, uh, yes, and, and, and content surveys are in the in a demand list. Currently, I have a valid skill assessment that Lahiru. I currently, I have a valid skill assessment for ANSCO 22 for organization and method analyst. And have it's a very, very good occupation. Uh, uh, and I think it's a very, uh, a very important job. I recently assisted somebody on a 482. Uh, have PTE 65, each EOI is created for 491, 80 points, 190, 70. Will there be a chance this year? Is there a way I can get a job under a 482? All right, there are two things. One is that, um, that your points are pretty good, right? And But still, I would like to have a look at your CV and your EOI to see whether you have explored all the opportunities. 
uh, in relation to getting a job under 482. Right. One of the two things you can do is your counterparts in whatever in Sri Lanka when you're working and if they are working um, in Australia, first reach out to them to see whether there are any opportunities in their organization. Number two is go to seek.com and you will suddenly notice that some jobs say sponsorship available. That's where you will say, that's what they're referring to is a 482, right? That's where they're referring to 482 or 186 or whatever it is. And then present your um, uh, CV and say, yes, I want a 482 sponsorship. And if you were selected, they'll be happy to um, grant you a 482 um, uh, sponsorship. It's a very niche, it's a very um, specific occupation. And um, I'm not too sure. I have had a few people who are waiting on on, on UIs on this one. So um, it'll be good, but uh, it'll be a very few organizations who will employ uh, an organization and method analyst. Yes. Right. Um, uh, Sophia, um, Stifa, um, I'm on a path of acquiring a 482 and a 491 visa type. In case the two clicks, which one do you think has a good transition into PR? I'm a pharmacist moving with my family and I. Uh, and in Nigeria. Yeah, look, uh, take the 491. If you get the 491, you have control over the visa. But remember, if you get the 482, you need to work for the employer, nobody else, but in two years' time. If you get a 491, you need to have three years and living in regional Australia. 482 can be anywhere, depending on where the employer is. Uh, to get an ENS, should I apply for jobs overseas to get spotted on Piper Asia? Yes, that's exactly what I, I said. Um, that's a good and also look out for ones which is sponsorship available. I work as an education administration in Sri Lanka for seven plus years. My 37 years old. I'm, I'm reading master's of education program at Electro Australia. Can I apply for a PR while I'm student? Please advise. Look, there are times that students, I have come across certain students, whilst they're studying, they had they had um, the requirements to migrate, and maybe the education agent didn't advise them properly. Uh, migration agent would have said, no, don't go to studies. You can apply for permanent residency. Have a, please send us a CV. Happy to have a look at it and see whether you, in fact, uh, qualify for permanent residency and stop you know, studying because obviously um, that's costing a lot of money and you can I mean, study after you get your permanent residency. I'm 26 years old. I've got a Bachelor of Applied Science, Honours. I have about one and a half years experience in software engineering. I'm trying to migrate to Australia with my partner, where will be the best option for me. Now, a person like you, Samira, need to complete two years. Why? You have to complete two years to get um, what we call um, a, a proper skill assessment from ACS. They need qualifications and two years of work experience. However, you'll be an ideal candidate for a 407 trainee visa sponsored by an Australian employee. For that, you need to get an Australian employee. What, uh, what are the potential reforms they are bringing in for? That's a very difficult question, but they have brought reforms and that's today. For it to very, very important. It is very welcoming a, 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 a relief of uh, relief for a lot of us. And uh, and uh, and um, I, I call it a fresh of uh, uh, breathing good air and fresh air coming to drive away. It is, um, it is something that uh, we have been waiting for quite a long time. So, I'm not too sure what the that uh, what uh, uh, reforms would be, but the main reform came today. Uh, Dishan, I have I says I have nine years experience um, as a service advisor. I have competent PT uh, overall fifty seven. I'm thirty three years old. My BSc science degree I completed in two thousand fifteen. Look, I would like to have a, a look at. Um, uh, uh, putting everything together. There'll be some engineering uh, occupation that you might suit. Um, so we have to have a closer look um, at um, whether how whether your occupation relates to automobile engineering, I suppose. Um, and uh, sometimes sometimes it's, it's very tricky. You're good, you've got a good qualification, you've got a good uh, um, occupation, but it doesn't tick all the boxes for Australia. Um, uh, Sasi Haran, working as a procurement assistant with six years experience, a bachelor's science degree. Yes, please do let us know. We have an occupation called import-export um, officer. Um, and uh, we like to see, have a look and see uh, whether you'd fall into any, yeah. 
Uh, could you explain more about regional areas? Okay, so what we talk about regional areas is, uh, is that any area which is not in Melbourne and the suburbs, Sydney and the suburbs, and Brisbane and the suburbs, any other area is in regional. Um, again, um, uh, yes, Deshan has come back and said, yes, motor mechanic for 2015 to 2017 and after the senior service advisor. So 2015 falls within the 10 years I was talking about, and we'll be quite interested to see, um, uh, Deshan, whether you could even qualify as a motor mechanic, right? Uh, and now going forward, um, as a service advisor, we, we might consider you as a retail manager in a dealership or a, uh, a larger uh, automobile uh, workshop in Australia who is willing to give uh, a sponsorship. Um, yes. Right. Let me... Uh, um, right. Not a problem at all. Um, so let's, let's move on. Um, just uh, uh, bear with me for one moment. Right, let's keep um, going. Yes, Jason, I hope I answered that question. Uh, interestingly, we, we should be able to assist you. How about a skill assessment for an electrician in general, sir? Because the witnesses are paused the new application that's because uh, that's because of the um, of there's a higher number of uh, occupations but but still i think we need to wait patiently and get that occupation uh, assessed um dishan also has come back uh, dishan please uh, you can send your cv to inquiries at sanjikadera.com um, or just go to the web uh, our website and all the details will be there so uh, it'll be inquiries at sanjkadra.com. Send an email uh, or, uh, or, uh, or give a call to us. Um, Taranga, um, uh, if you have launched an EOI for multiple visa categories, uh, does it increase the chances including a spouse, uh, including spouse skill assessment? So the EOIs have to have the spouse skill assessment and, and uh, spouse skill assessment claim correctly. And if the spouse has six, uh, six IATS, six, also claiming 10 points, yeah. Um, would uh, multiple UIs increase our chances? But no, multiple increases doing the saying, okay, 189, 189, 189 is not going to help at all. That's not going to happen. But multiple UIs for different states, different visa categories, yes, will help. I'm a nurse with 19 years experience and 44 I have a diploma in nursing. Is there a possible way of migrate to Australia with my family? Look, I answered this question. Unfortunately, for a nurse, you have to come to Australia and study. But uh, with the age of 44, if you come to Australia and study for a couple of years, you go over 45 and then lose the opportunity of migration. Ishara uh, says, uh, um, Hi, sir, I'm Mark. I have three years' experience regarding carpentry in Sri Lanka, but I don't have any qualification. According to this, can I apply for a degree in Australia? Now, if you are a if you are a carpenter, um, um, we'd like to look at your CV. We'd like to look at what you have done for your A levels and why you choose carpentry. It will be very difficult for you to suddenly switch um, and suddenly say, "Look, I want to do a bachelor's degree." Um, but certainly happy to have a look. You, as a carpenter, we can get if you don't even have a qualifications, we can get what we call our RPL, that's recognized prior learning. Uh, we do some uh, testing find out whether you're a carpenter and whether you're suitable at the level uh, of an Australian carpenter. And then carpentry is very, very highly in demand. And we hope we can even hopefully assist you in finding a job as a carpenter. Uh, who will be willing to sponsor you on a 482? So then the qualifications or points doesn't matter anymore. But for a 482, you need to have English, IELTS score 5 each or PT 35 each. I'm currently working as an environment sustainable executive at Apparel Industry in Sri Lanka. Since last year, I'm 26 years age. Have I got any chances? Yes, look, it, it's a very tricky question. I need to look at your bachelor's degree. I need to look at your uh, certain designation occupations. And uh, we, we should be able to uh, look at that when you uh, send me that. Um, 26 years of age, applied science honors, about one and a half years experience of engineering. I'm trying to migrate. I think I answered this question before. You need to have two years, but you have to have a major in uh, IT. If you don't have a major in IT, then it takes a longer time of work experience to get 
get get a skill assessment. Electrical engineering and uh, sorry, I missed one thing here. Yes, I'm Nishan. My wife has a BSc in psychology. She has been working as a special need teacher for more than five years in Qatar. Uh, her skill assessment, I gain, it's a skill assessment, I get five points. She already have IA60 all. Now the question is not too very clear, Nishan. Uh, please, send, uh, please send her CV to our UAE branch. Um, and uh, and they will be able to have a chat with you and assess exactly what, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, 39 years, yes, uh, 39 uh, Sebastian will qualify, as I said, up to 45. I'm 31, completed BSc in Mechatronics Engineering in 2018. I have worked as an assistant engineer for 2020-2022, later working as a mechanical engineer for 2000. Will I have a chance? Yes, you have. Mechatronics go into electronics and mechanical engineering. Depending on the, the, the subject matter that you have done in mechatronics engineering, bachelor's, uh, and the type of work experience combined together, you should be able to get, uh, as a possibility to get a, a skill assessment as a mechanical engineer under a, what we call a CBR com competency demonstration report, not through the Washington Accord. Um, okay, what would be the best subclass opportunities for the IT job streams to consider for permanent residency? Factor in that I have got four years work experience in IT business analysis. It's not about the best opportunity. We look at all opportunities, 189, 491, and 190. Your relationship manager uh, would be able to advise you of what the what the best opportunity is. And you take anything you get, whether it's 491, you get it, you have control of getting your PR. Um, when we can change. When we can change for two visa to PR after two years of work, then if we have only two years visa and until process PR, we can stay without a visa. This is a very, very quick question, and it's a very important question, Namal. What you're asking me is, you have a two-year for two, right? And I say that you need to work as a for two. So then your visa finishes. How? What do you do, right? So in that situation, right, you need to get a new for two for a very short period of time. There is a possibility. Just wait until the last two or three days and apply, but you're taking a big risk and telling the immigration department, look, I have done it not to go for another 482. You know, I have completed my 482. Will you consider risky? I would go for an extension on a 482 and then apply. Is your current financial sales required for a skilled migration? No. However, I'm going to qualify that. But certain state governments, when they sponsor, they want to know whether you have, you know, some sort of funds to manage on your own. So uh, there are some states, I can't tell you sort of exactly offhand, but that too, it's just a declaration, not that you have to show bank statements or anything like that. Um, right, got a positive skill assessment in survey and spatial science technician, very good. Age 32 experience, five plus, English 50, or 491, got 65 points with state sponsorship. My question, should I go for an EOI or try 42 is I haven't seen sponsored for a civil field, but a lot of job offers for electric. You do both at the same time, whatever comes first. But um, if you get an invitation for a 491, you must take it. Don't worry about the 482. If you get a 491, you need to take the, the 491 visa. <clears throat> I'm a registered nurse, BSc degree, um, complete text January, already have English. I can apply. Can I apply for a 482? Uh, for a caregiver with a, without a skill assessment. Now we are waiting. We are waiting for the new um, uh, uh, the 482, where I said occup, occup, it can be any occupation. If so, if that thing comes, yes, you can. Graduate in human resources. Finish my studies in Curtin University, WA. Have more than five years experience. Is there any possibility of applying for a HR job? In Australia, yes, like, I mean, I say HR job. I mean, you need to find the employer, but um, if you have done your HR, there is a possibility that you go through the general skill migration. You don't have to find an employer. Remember that when people migrate to Australia on the general skill migration, they come and do any other jobs till they find their jobs in their fields. But that's not so in employer nomination. You have to do your, uh, the work that the job that you came to um, do. Um. 
Yasuru says, 27 logistics management degree, hold a three years work experience, any chance of migration, try subclass 600, but but it refused. Okay, subclass 600 is a holy tourist visa. So you have got a tourist visa refusal. Um, um, and no, look, uh, let's have a look at your CV and see uh, how we can assist you on, on, on that. Um, don't worry, a tourist visa refusal will not um, impact your, your history. What are the challenges? Uh, Vimal says, um, okay, Vimal, uh, uh, it has been answered. Um, sorry, sometimes I miss out because our panel also may be answering your questions. My party is 25 years old, trying to market, make a glass of water to talk. My partner, who is 25 years old, trying to migrate to Australia as a caregiver, but still following the relevant course in advanced caregiver, what will be the possibility to come to Australia? What will be the IATs? Look, there has been some real misinformation in Sri Lanka. I get a lot of questions about this caregiver. Um, we don't know uh, with the with the rules uh, whether it, it'll get relaxed, but up to now, it was where a very selected amount of, of companies, specially identified by the government who under DAMA, who could um, uh, who could get um, caregivers, and there has been some lot of misinformation back in Sri Lanka. Um, we'll wait for the we'll wait for the new rules to come, and then uh, caregivers will have an opportunity. Just moving between states during a temporary visa also require the skillless migration steps. Didn't answer that question. No, moving states doesn't need a different skill assessment, um, but the skill assessment can be used. Um, yeah, um, right. I think Bimal, your uh, question is being answered by uh, the panel. Um, and uh, Dishan, may I send the set? Uh, send my resume to the email info at sanjikadran.com. Yeah, you are quite welcome to do that. Nishan, uh, for partner skill assessment, SC190. My wife has a BSc in psychology. She has been working as a special, and yeah, I think I answered this particular question. She has, uh, but I'll go through that again. Um, uh, I will answer. Um, I would like to know, uh, as a special, as a teacher, uh, whether she has got teaching qualifications too. Let me have a look at your CV, and as I said, uh, send it to our Dubai office and um, under inquiries at Sanjay Kadra, and we'll be happy to have a look at it. Right. Okay. So we are coming to uh, um, coming to. We'll keep. Uh, it will keep our, our, the webinar going for a little while longer. Um, and um, to see whether there are any uh, other uh, other questions uh, that come, uh, has come about. In the recent past, I want to uh, have a chat about this. In the recent past, we have uh, a situation where there is more opportunity in the employee nomination uh, rather than uh, here in, in the general skill migration. So always keep an uh, eye open for potential employers. I have that conversation, especially if you're in Australia. Right. Um, uh, Priyanka, uh, I'm in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm especially my husband registered nurse. He has a diploma of work, called work experience, 20 years, 55 years old age, uh, work 55, year, 55 years of age, uh, work general hospital in Hamantara. As I said, yes, the nurses have to come and study here, but with the age of 55, you can't apply for permanent residency. Right. Um, yes, as I was I'm mentioning uh, uh, that, uh, please remember to uh, please remember to uh, uh, that to pursue employer nomination uh, while looking at general skill migration. Apply for your jobs. There is a good possibility that you'd be interviewed and chosen and sponsored because uh, there is uh, very serious skill shortages in um, in uh, in Australia. Right. Um, Okay, so we'll answer a few more questions, and uh, before we call, um, we uh, have these uh, uh, the conclusion of this uh, webinar. Um, after applying for four nine one, do I have to be employed in the same occupation when a UI is nominating? Is it compulsory considering the current situation, Sri Lanka construction field? Do I have to stay employed for a long time now? No, look, the your your 
uh, it freezes at the time of uh, getting an invitation. Whatever happens after you get the invitation, doesn't it's not counted. So I think that's the the question. Um, uh, from a migration agency point of view, how do you all support for ENS? Now, we are not a job agency, but there are times that we have been working with many, many employers and we know their requirements. So sometimes if somebody will appear and say, can you find a job? We're not a job agency, but we might be able to pass on those CVs to our employers and say, look, would you like to uh, consider not all occupations, uh, but some occupation. The ENS, how we support is that should you have found an employer, we advise both the employer and the employee because there are, in the 482, there are three applications in the four, uh, uh, permanent resident ENS, there are two applications. An employer has to lodge an application and the employee has to lodge the application. So we support all that. Uh, I'm in Australia in bridging visa, but I'm studying commercial cookery. Could you please tell me how can I get a no, look, Ishara, there's not enough information for me to answer that question. I'm not too sure what bridging visa you have applied uh, and uh, you're studying uh, cookery, what have you studied before. All that is very, very important. Please feel free. It's obligation free to mention about today's uh, webinar and send your CV to have a have a chat to see what, uh, what um, opportunities that are, are, are there. Right. I hope I have uh, answered um, uh, as uh, many questions as possible as in, in the very short period of time. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is important to get the application right, get the, um, the qualifications uh, assessed correctly, the work experience claimed correctly uh, in, in, your, in your pathway to... Uh, now, I will touch on... Um, if uh, I'll give a few moments for some other questions as we have got. Uh, remember, uh, there are lots of other ways that um, it may not, might not be applicable to you. Um, Australian um, Australian residents and citizens can sponsor their parents, their children, and if they're single and they get married to a, a partner who lives other, outside Australia, then partner visas and, and so forth. Right. Um, I uh, This question is, I have, I'm single, um, cumulative experience of five years at ERP concert and interest in migrating to Australia would I have got yes certainly you would uh, hopefully you're covered with a good uh, IT uh, bachelor's degree too I've applied several occupations to seek uh, various job sites they're all requesting availability on uh, show for that do we have an opportunity to apply for offshore yes look uh, uh, you're referring to Dishanto, I think about a 482 you had to keep on trying yeah that's some of people say you have to be offshore to get this job. But if, as I said, if the if the job advertisement says sponsorship available, then there's a good opportunity. Um, okay, last year I have come to your Colombo Hilton. I think you are referring to Colombo uh, uh, at the uh, Galadari. Yes, uh, great to uh, and uh, met uh, Angelo Norton. He sent me the email as well, but progress uh, hold from my side. Can I resume with him? Yes, you certainly. And Angelo is today in our panel too. Uh, uh, and uh, certainly it is Angelo at Um And now he's based in, in our Sydney office. So um, yes, and he is, uh, if you have met him, please feel free um, to uh, start communicating with him. Um, and I hope uh, Angela has given you some good uh, advice at the, at, at the initial consultations. Can a management trainee experience claim as relevant experience during a skill assessment? Uh, it, it really depends on what the occupation is. It, it depends on uh, how that skill assessing body will look at uh, the management trainee uh, occupation and the job duties. So it's quite different from from uh, from. Um, uh, state to state. Right. Now, excellent. I'm sure you might have other questions uh, and, and so forth. Um, I would really uh, like to thank you for um, uh, for attending this webinar on this weekend. I hope you can take something away. And um, it, it is uh, some of the questions I had to answer 
very briefly because some of the, that I need to have all the information. We have some excellent relationship managers who will assist you in your um, general skill migration as well as uh, you are um, uh, uh, employer sponsored uh, visas. We, we, if, you, if an employee is interested, we will always go and talk to the employer and uh, explain the situation and talk on behalf of you. Um, and uh, yes, and uh, before I call today, I'll st still answer a few more questions. Um, uh, Carla, thank you very much uh, for um, for uh, thanking us. I'm more than happy to have you and thank you so much for attending. Um, and I've got another question. I have secured a BSA honors in information systems from the University of Westminster currently working as a SAP concern. What are the issues proceed to connect connect with ACS for skill assessment and there's a particular format employer reference. All those will be given by, um, contact us, all those will be given the format, what it should contain, in what format, what is the information that you have to go in and it's and all the supporting documents. So we'll assist you right through the, that ACS uh, process. Um, yeah, have you been doing a FOI tool for, for caregiver, as I said, up to now, no. The reason being, it's very limited to a few uh, employers. All right, we have had an excellent session. Um, please uh, visit our website um, at uh, www.sanjikaldera.com. Um, you can send your emails to inquiries at sanjikaldera.com or even info at sanjikaldera.com. And uh, we would be, we'll stand by to assist you in any of your Australian migration um, uh, questions, issues, and so forth. Um, finally, uh, trust uh, you have a great weekend and uh, most importantly, uh, take care of yourself. This um, would be, a, this uh, presentation would be also available on, on Facebook, um, on uh, Sanjikadra. Facebook and um, uh, and uh, please feel free to uh, contact us. Um, I had um, yes, and I had one final uh, question. Um, uh, thank you, Asri, for your uh, appreciation. Um, I hope uh, you did uh, uh, get something from uh, this uh, webinar. We will be hoping to um, have regular webinars, maybe um, uh, perhaps. Um, uh, in perhaps early uh, late January. Uh, remember, as I said, we for the people in the Hill Country, um, they can visit us at KCC on the 9th of December uh, with a great team of relationship managers. And also, uh, we will be in Jaffna on the uh, on the 20th of January at the Jaffna Fair. We would have um, uh, our relationship managers uh, being available, and most probably. Uh, uh, we'll let you know uh, when the next webinar will take place. Um, have a good day and please keep safe. And once again, uh, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar and uh, please get in touch with your queries. Bye-bye for now.